All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, for those who are new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms uh, across North America and beyond, so all over the world. Uh, in these challenging times, we've been broadcasting three to four live events a day, broadcasting live into the homes of students, uh, educators and parents everywhere. So it's so great to be able to continue the learning and have so many groups joining in. In fact, I'm just looking at the YouTube right now. I see groups already starting to introduce themselves. So please use that chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from. Looks like we have groups joining us in Colombia. Uh, so great to have uh, some groups joining us from South America. We've got North Bay in Ontario, uh, New Jersey. So keep introducing yourselves and I'll give some shout outs. Uh, during today's event as well. So today's event's another a little bit of a unique one as I'm hosting, but I'm also going to be doing the speaking today. So uh, I founded Exploring by Seed Your Pants. I'm also an explorer with the National Geographic Society, and I get to go on some pretty cool uh, expeditions from time to time, and I'm going to share uh, some of those with you today. So uh, I got to visit uh, a place called the Galapagos, a place that as someone who studied biology and science, there was nowhere else in the world uh, that I wanted to visit more. So I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to bring up the presentation and we are going to dive right in. All right, so you should see my screen now. I'm going to take things full screen here. All right, there we go. So this is a map of South uh, America and you can see here that Ecuador is right here on the Pacific coast. Uh, and then about a thousand uh, miles or so off the coast, we have this little tiny group of volcanic islands called the Galapagos. So I'm gonna zoom in on those islands here. And let's get a little better look here. So this is the island group. Um, this is, uh, as I mentioned, volcanic islands and they kind of move on a conveyor belt, kind of moving towards the coast of South America. So when you're over here in the west, this is the young part of the island. This is Fernandina, this is Isabella. And there's a volcanic hotspot on the seafloor, and that's how these islands develop. So over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, as the magma came up from the seafloor, it cooled and stacked higher and higher and higher until you had the island starting to poke out from below the surface. So you have here these young islands that are still very volcanically active. Volcanoes still do erupt. Uh, here from time to time. And then as you move east, they start to get less active. So these ones aren't active anymore. And in fact, by the time you get to the older islands over here, they're starting to erode. Um, they're much less active. And if you went underwater towards the coast of South America, you would find islands of the Galapagos that have sunk below the surface. They've eroded so much that they're no longer above the surface. Of I think that's really cool. So this is definitely a place on the planet, uh, a new place in some areas, but very old uh, in others. So this is us flying in. So initially I flew into Waikil in uh, Ecuador, and then we had to take another little plane flight to get over to uh, the islands. So we flew into the island, uh, the island of Baltra. And you can see here the volcanic nature of these islands. This is an island called Daphne Major. And as you fly over top, you can see uh, that it, well, looks a lot like a volcano. You've got a big crater in the middle, uh, obviously not active anymore. Uh, and then you can see it's a very accessible island. It's really hard uh, to get close to this island. And that makes it a really good spot for research. There's an amazing study that's on this island studying finches uh, for years and years and years because of, you know, it's so inaccessible. All right, so this was my home for 10 days. For 10 days, I was on board the National Geographic Endeavor and we moved along the islands. So I'm actually gonna back up just for a second here. And I wanna share the islands that we visited. So we landed here in Baltra. Uh, we visited North Seymour. We visited Rabida, Santiago. We visited the youngest island, Fernandina. We visited Isabella, looks like kind of a big seahorse. It's actually six volcanoes that have kind of risen from the ocean and fused together. We also visited Santa Cruz uh, and San Cristobal. So those are some of the islands that we visited during uh, that time in the Galapagos. I'm gonna jump forward again. 
And so this was our this was our home. We we ate on here, we lived on here, and then every day as we'd visit new islands, visit new places, uh, we'd hop into little zodiacs, tiny little boats with motors on the back, and we'd head to shore to hike. We'd head out to go snorkeling. We'd go along the shoreline to take pictures uh, of the animals we saw along the shore. So it was pretty busy days, nonstop. Sometimes jumping into the zodiacs uh, three or four times a day, which is pretty cool. And then the life on the islands is amazing. So the Galapagos uh, were volcanic islands, very barren when they started, you know, just black rock as the lava cooled. But over thousands and thousands of years, life found its way to the islands. So birds, right? Birds and insects, they can get there by flying. Um, plants could get there over time, uh, maybe carried over by birds, maybe drifting. Uh, in the wind, the seeds making their way to the island. But how do some of the other animals get there? How did things like tortoises uh, and iguanas and lizards and snakes get, you know, a thousand miles to the Galapagos? Well, there'd be big storms off the coast of um, South America, and that would wash big rafts of leaves and tree trunks and other things into the ocean. And these uh, reptiles and other species could drift um, and eventually make it to the Galapagos. And if a few um, made it there, some males and females, and they could establish populations on the island. So over thousands of years, uh, this incredible amount of life has, has made it there, has adapted to the island, has evolved over time to be very different from the species that you would find on the mainland uh, in South America. And many species in the Galapagos are endemic. And that's a big word that just means found nowhere else in the world, uh, except for in the Galapagos. So I love watching these birds. These are blue footed boobies and there's a male and a female here and you can see these blue feet. So this male is dancing. He is dancing for the female to try and get her attention saying, I'd be a really good mate. I'd be perfect uh, to have chicks with. And so you can see she's watching him dance and she's really watching his feet. Okay, and the bluer the feet, the more healthy the bird is. It means it's, it's hunting, it's getting a lot of fish, it's getting a lot of pigment that's turning its feet blue. And so the bluer the feet, the healthier this bird is, and more likely that the female will choose him uh, for a mate. So we watched this dance for well over 10 minutes while he tried all kinds of things to get her attention and she was watching. You can see another part of the dance here. This is called sky pointing. So every once in a while, he'd point up, 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 up at the sky and call out anything you could do to try and get her attention. But unlucky for him, uh, after about 10 minutes, she decided, nope, those feet just aren't blue enough. Uh, and she flew away to look and see who else was available. Now, these are pretty cool. These are land iguanas. So these land iguanas, they stake out little territories, little areas they call their own. And then their territories all have prickly pear cactuses in them. And that's their food. So they protect them. Uh, to make sure they can protect their food source. So take a look at what this prickly pear cactus looks like. You can see, it doesn't look like something that very tasty for you or I to eat, but you can see that uh, the little bites that the land iguana takes uh, from them. So there's nice little bites there from those prickly pear uh, cactuses. Here's another really cool bird. This is a frigate bird. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the frigate bird later and why it gets its name as like a pirate or a pirate of the sky. But this is a male and this male is doing exactly what the blue footed booby was doing in the earlier picture. It's looking for a mate. So normally that big, beautiful red pouch looks like a deflated balloon. You know, we've all seen a little balloon in a package before you blow it up. It looks like a little red deflated balloon under there. But when trying to attract a female's attention, it can fill that big sack with air and then it waits as the females fly over. And when a female flies over, it shakes its wings, it calls out, it tries to really show off that big red sack to say, look, I can keep this inflated for a long period of time. It's so bright and red, I'm really healthy. I can find lots of food for our chicks. I'd be an excellent choice. So that's another way that a bird can try to attract a mate in the Galapagos, like this frigate bird. So we saw the land iguana. But these guys are pretty cool. These are the marine iguanas and they're incredibly unique. They're the only uh, you know, lizards that can swim in the ocean and find their food and eat their food. So 
That land iguana and this marine iguana are related species. It would have been a common ancestor that drifted to the island tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then over time um, and through evolution, they came, became specialized in their little niches, their different habitats. And so this day for a marine iguana, they wake up in the morning, they warm up in the sun, they head down to the ocean and dive in. They swim out and then dive down sometimes 10 meters or deeper and looking for algae growing on the rocks. That's what they love to eat. The problem is cold water around the Galapagos so they can only stay down for a certain amount of time. They swim back to shore and warm up uh, in the sun again. So you can see here, sometimes they get lucky. Sometimes at low tide, they can get their food right at the shore. So here's a few marine iguanas enjoying a buffet. Uh, they don't have to go too deep into the water so it doesn't cool them down too much. Uh, and they can find the food that they like right on the shore without having to swim too far. You see a little crab hanging out here, a little Sally Lightfoot crab on the rock as well. Here's one just enjoying some time in the sun after a swim, so warming up uh, after eating. And this is one of my favorite pictures. So if you're on a beach in the Galapagos, it's black lava rock like this, and it's usually covered in marine iguanas. And if you sit, what do you hear? You hear sneezing. You hear lots of sneezing, sneezing, sneezing all day long. And that is how the marine iguanas get salt out of their body. So you can imagine if you're swimming in the ocean and you're eating algae that's full of salt water, that you get a lot of salt in your body. Well, they've got a special little gland in their nose that where the salt in the body accumulates and they sneeze and that gets the salt out of their body. So they sit all day long in these big groups sneezing snot salt all over each other. So you can see this one here is blasting out some salt rockets here, blasting out some salty snot. And if we go back and forth, you can kind of see uh, this sneeze happening. You can see all that salty uh, material landing on all its buddies. So that's what you hear sitting on the beach in the Galapagos is lots of sneezing from the marine iguanas. Now the Galapagos is pretty special in that over 90% of the islands are completely protected. So left alone, completely protected. Uh, nobody can visit other than scientists with special permission, special permits. Um, and then there's four parts, kind of small parts on different islands where people uh, can live. And we'll talk about one of those spots in a minute. You can see these beautiful untouched beaches where, you know, at night, the sea turtles are hauling themselves up to lay eggs. And, you know, they're, they're trying really hard to keep everything protected, um, get rid of some of the invasive species that people have brought with them, uh, and let the Galapagos uh, kind of be and do its thing. Here's another island. The amazing thing about the Galapagos, you can visit every different island and you feel like you're landing in a different country than when you visit every island. So this is Rabida, and Rabida is a beautiful island. It's red. All the rocks are red. They're volcanic rocks that are very rich in iron. So just like a car can rust being left out to the elements, so can these rocks. These rocks over time, the, the air and the water have acted on them and the iron in the rock has turned this kind of red color, making the whole island look like uh, it's rusted. Now this is Porto Aero. So Porto Aero has about 18,000 people who live there. And it's the only place in the world I've ever had to walk over a sea lion to go to the bank. So the animals in the Galapagos, they really don't care very much about people. For tens of thousands of years, there haven't been any really big predators. Uh, so the animals don't really care much about people walking around. They don't move out of the way. Sometimes they'll trample right over you like a tortoise or a sea lion if you're not careful. And this was what it was like in Puerto Aero, especially by the water. There were marine iguanas walking through town sea lions resting on park benches and out front of stores, pelicans and, and other birds in the fish market. So really neat to see a place um, like this. And, and that's what happens in, in islands around the world when there's not a lot of predators. The animals don't really fear humans uh, and other visitors to the island, which can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing uh, for those animals. This is the largest predator on the Galapagos. And I should say the largest natural predator this is the Galapagos hawk. They hunt things like snakes and small marine iguanas. Um, and so that the largest natural predator, unfortunately, 
uh, people have brought species to the island. Uh, things like dogs and cats, um, mice and rats, which then prey on eggs uh, and small lizards and things like that, um, goats uh, and other livestock. So humans have brought over thousands of years, have brought lots of different invasive species from plants to insects, uh, you name it. And in fact, on the island of Rabida, the Galapagos hawks were in trouble of disappearing. And so the national parks, they, the, they had to do something. They had to do something to protect the birds. So they caught all the hawks on the island and they took them away for two weeks to like a, a hawk hotel for two weeks. And during that time, they put uh, rat and mice, you know, poison all over the island, which was able to kill all the rats and the mice on the island. And then were able to safely bring the birds back. So Rabida is a conservation success story in that they got rid of all the mice and all of the rats that were brought by humans and were killing all the, the, the small lizards and all the small uh, eggs that the birds were laying. And they were able to bring back uh, the hawks to the island. So an example of some of the conservation work that's happening in the Galapagos. These guys are pretty cool. These are the flightless cormorants. And so, uh, you know, with a lack of predators, uh, after they got to the island and tens of thousands of years for evolution to work, their wings have become vestigial. And what that means is these tiny little wings are no good for flying anymore. So on the mainland, cormorants can fly, but on the Galapagos, they don't need to. So their wings don't work that way for them anymore. However, they've got these big, strong back legs they use when they're swimming in the water looking for fish, and they are incredible to see in the water. So this is a male. He just came back from hunting for some fish. And he's got a present for the female bird. He's got this seaweed. Apparently, female flightless cormorants love seaweed. So she's, he's bringing back a present for her. And if you look in the next picture, you can see he's dropped the present off at the nest. He's warming up in the sun after being in the cold, cold ocean. She's getting ready to go swim and find some food. And then he'll feed these two chicks. You can see one chick here. And the other one's just hiding in the back. Hard to kind of see. But there's two chicks here in this nest. And you could just sit and watch these birds do their things for hours, which is pretty awesome. On the beach, here's a ghost crab. You can see they've got their little holes. They hide really quickly when they see people. But then if you wait, if you're really patient, they'll poke out so you can get cool pictures of them. Here's another crab species, a Sally Lightfoot crab. You'll find them all over the rocks, all over the volcanic rocks around the ocean, uh, on the islands. Here's some Galapagos mockingbirds. So there's four different species in the Galapagos. They're all slightly different. Um, and the finches get a lot of credit for Darwin's theory of evolution. But in reality, they didn't play that big of a role early on as Darwin was thinking about, um, you know, this idea of natural selection is actually Galapagos mockingbirds played a bigger role uh, earlier on. And then the water. So the Galapagos is cold, nutrient-rich water. So deep, deep water, it hits the islands and it's forced up to the top uh, around the shores. So that pushes nutrients to the top, making these cold waters full of life. So sometimes I'd be in the water and I'd look around me and I'd see 20 or 30 green sea turtles swimming around me. It was absolutely incredible. You know, as a scuba diver, I've been diving with turtles and sometimes you see one or two at a time, but to look around and see over 20 uh, was pretty wild. And so these green sea turtles, they get their name, not because of the color they are, but because of what they eat. They eat so much seagrass, so much algae that it turns their fat green. If we could look inside this green sea turtle, we'd see it has green fat and that's where their name comes from. Sometimes uh, I can get a little carried away when snorkeling, when swimming. So this happened, there was a glass bottom boat that they could lower into the water. So some people who weren't comfortable uh, jumping in to the water could use the glass bottom boat and look down. So I was showing off one day and swimming underneath the glass bottom boat and waving. And there was a little bit of rock sticking up a little higher from the reef uh, than I thought it was. And I hit my shoulder. It was no big deal. Got it cleaned up by the ship's medic and then right back into the water. So no big deal. So I've got a little video I'm going to share with you shortly of these guys. But this is the best part of swimming in the Galapagos is the sea lions. They will play with you all day. They will blow bubbles in your face. They will sneak up and try to pull your fins off from behind. They'll do somersaults with you. They love swimming and playing uh, in the water, the young ones. Now the males can get up to be 400 pounds. 
they don't like to play as much. So if you see one of those in the water, you don't want to get too close, but the young sea lions, they love, love to play. And I'm going to share a video with you shortly. And on shore, they don't always get along. So here's two of them having a little bit of an argument, uh, sorting things out. It looks tough. It looks like there's a lot of biting, but it actually isn't really. It's a lot of posturing, which means they kind of fake bite each other. They make loud noises. They show how big their mouths are. They don't really hurt each other when they fight. Uh, in this situation, uh, it's a little different if the male's trying to protect his beach though, then they can be a lot, but the fights can be a lot tougher. And then there's these great moments like this. Here's a pup, maybe a week and a half, two weeks old, and it's having a little bit of milk from its mom. So you get to catch these really tender, these really beautiful moments uh, on the shore. And so I said, I'd come back to the frigate birds. So the frigate birds are called the pirates of the sky because they're lazy. They don't like to catch their own food. Instead, they'll wait till other birds like the blue footed boobies catch some fish and then they will harass and bother those fish, uh, those birds until they drop their fish or they barf their fish back up and then the frigate bird will eat it. So you can see this frigate bird here is bugging these two boobies trying to get them to regurgitate the, the fish that they just caught. So that's why they get that name, Pirates of the Sky. They're a little bit lazy and they like to steal their food from others when they can. And the tortoises, we'll wrap up with the tortoises. So the tortoises are absolutely amazing. Every island that has tortoises, they are a different species and they are adapted to that island. So on this island here, we've got these saddleback tortoises. They've got this big back here, big long necks. And that lets them reach up and grab food from higher off the ground. They can get things that other uh, animals can't reach. If we move over here, you can see this is on a different island. This is on Santa Cruz. And these tortoises don't have those long necks. They eat their food right from the ground. Um, so each island has its unique species, although on some islands they have gone extinct. And that's largely obviously due to humans. So when sailors would visit, visit these islands hundreds of years ago, tortoises were easy to catch. They could turn them upside down and leave them in the store, the storage areas of the ship. And then they could have fresh meat for months and months because uh, the tortoises could live for months turned up on their backs. And unfortunately on some islands, uh, the species were completely wiped out. Let me give you an idea of how big some of them can get. So this looks huge and it is, it's a big tortoise. This is a duck and the duck's about as big as this tortoise's foot but they could be even bigger. You know, Charles Darwin, when he visited the island, talked about sitting on the back of one uh, and riding on a tortoise. You can imagine how big uh, they were uh, hundreds of years ago before uh, humans, you know, took a lot of them from the islands. And here's one more shot just here, trying to get a picture uh, of this tortoise. It eventually turned towards me and kept coming towards me. And I had to roll out of the way eventually so I wouldn't get run over uh, in slow motion by this tortoise. All right, so that is it for the pictures. I'm gonna come back from the screen share. And I'm gonna share a couple of videos with you now before we go to some Q and A. So give me a second to load up the screen share again and let's start off with our sea lions. All right, so that should be nice and full screen for you now. Where's my sea lions? There they are. And let's hit play here. Really fast, they love to play. Steal your flippers if they could. Sometimes they'll disappear. And if you go down and do a somersault, that gets them to come back out. They get really excited when they see that you want to keep playing. All right, let's load up another video here. This time I wanna take you to see the, the flightless cormorants. I want you to see what they're like in the water. Spoiler alert, it's really cool. So here we go. 
flightless cormorant. Look at those big, strong back legs for diving underwater. There's a sea turtle. Now, if you watch, it's gonna come up with a little orange fish. So it's looking under these ledges, looking for little fish to snag. So watch carefully. There we go. And you can see it is not bothered by me floating in the water here at all. It could care less that I'm there. In fact, I'm surprised it didn't just crawl right over top of me if I got in the way. All right, one more video clip that I would like to share with you today. And this is in the water in the Galapagos. We'll give you a little idea of what the marine life is like. So that should be sharing now and let's hit play. So we're heading into snorkel. Big schools of fish. You can see some colorful parrot fish mixed in there as well. Here's one of the green sea turtles having a little munch on the rocks. Nice little white tip reef shark cruising through. So lots of life in these cold nutrient rich waters. And what's pretty cool is with these waters being so cold uh, and nutrient rich, you can get species together that you don't normally see in other places. So for instance, you can find sea lions and fur seals. So there's not many places in the world where you can find you know, those warm and cold water loving species together. And then I didn't show a picture because I didn't get a good picture. They're kind of blurry of the Galapagos penguin. So think about that, a penguin uh, living up at the Galapagos on the equator, one of the warmest places on the planet, but those cold nutrient rich waters uh, let them survive and find the food that they need. Pretty darn cool. All right, well, I am gonna turn things over to questions. I hope you can see uh, now, why I love the Galapagos, why I think it's one of the most incredible places on the planet, finding species you can't find anywhere else. Um, and the work that they're doing, I highly suggest you dig in a bit deeper, check out the Charles Darwin uh, Research Station and find out the incredible conservation work they're doing, as well as the research that they are doing as well. So I'd love to see some questions start to come in via the YouTube chat. I will keep an eye out for those questions. We also have a few families joining us on camera today as well. So I'm gonna take some live cameras uh, from those groups. In fact, we are gonna start with one here uh, in New Jersey. We have Landon and Claire joining us. If you wanna pop your mic on, I'd love a question if you have a question. What are some of your favorite or most unique adaptions in the Galapagos animals? All right, great, great question. Well, you saw one of them. You saw uh, the, the marine iguanas. So not only did they find a way to, to find a food source uh, that other animals can't use by going into the ocean, diving deep and eating that algae off the rocks, but then they were able to get the salt out of their bodies by sneezing uh, that snot on each other all day long. So that's pretty cool. I think that's a pretty cool uh, adaptation. Uh, let's see, what's another really cool one? Oh, the finches. Okay, so the finches, there's, they look very similar. If you look at them closely and you look at them on different islands, their beaks are all slightly different. And that's because it's all dependent on their food source. So they, if they have really thin beaks, they might be eating things like insects or small seeds. If they have very big, thick beaks, well, that means they're probably eating bigger nuts, so they need to crush them. There's even a species of finch uh, that uses a tool. So it takes spines from a cactus. It'll fly over to a little tree or in the cactus and poke around in little holes for grubs. 
and it'll stab the grubs and pull them out and then eat them. So those are pretty good examples. This finch, maybe one species that arrived on the island thousands and thousands of years ago has adapted to fill different habitats uh, all over the islands and their beaks have just changed ever so slightly to help them do that. I think that's pretty cool. That's a great question uh, to get us started. Uh, lots of adaptions we could talk about though. So I highly suggest you dig a little bit deeper. Uh, let's see. Okay, Hunter wants to know about, this is from YouTube, about some insects in the Galapagos. So great thing about the Galapagos, no mosquitoes. So that's pretty cool. You can be out walking around. You don't have to worry about bug spray uh, and things like that. Didn't see a lot of insects in the Galapagos. They're definitely there. You know, there's little flies um, that you see, uh, little ants, things like that. But there's, this is a good spot to tell a little story about uh, insects in the Galapagos. So invasive species were, have been brought by humans to the Galapagos. Sometimes insects come uh, in people's baggage. Sometimes they come uh, in fruits and other produce that's delivered to the islands. Maybe they come on board of a ship and they can cause a lot of trouble. There's a species of fly in particular and it likes to lay its eggs in the nest of the little finches, these little finches that live in the marshes, these little marsh finches. And when the eggs hatch, the flies pick at the skin uh, of the baby birds and eventually kill them. So um, you can see why that's a big problem. The numbers of those finches have dropped an incredible amount. So I think there's something like 40 pairs of these finches left. Um, so it's not a good situation. So there's a project, a conservation project going on right now to try and get rid of those flies. But think about how tough this is. On one hand, they have to get rid of this tiny fly from the island without hurting any of the insects that are supposed to be there. So that's hard right there. And at the same time, they have to protect the eggs and the baby finches. So what they'll do is they'll take the finches into the babies and they'll raise them in captivity to give them a nice head start and get them nice and healthy. And then they can release them back to the wild. But that's not cheap. That can cost uh, well over $10,000 to raise uh, a baby bird. So um, that's a, a big conservation challenge is how do you get rid of those insects without getting rid of the natural ones that are supposed to be there? And at the same time, how can you protect and boost the population of those marsh finches? So very interesting uh, dilemma happening uh, with that conservation program, but they're doing great work. Uh, let's see, let's turn on another one here. So we have a group that is joining us, a family group. Uh, in New Jersey as well. Let me turn uh, the microphone on. It's listed as Linda's iPad, but it looks like we have a couple joining us there. So let me turn that mic on. How are you guys doing today? Good. I'm Doodle. I'm filling in for Linda. All right. Excellent. Good to have you. Who's our friend joining us today? All right. Thanks for joining us today, bud. How much does an albatross weigh and what's the size of its eggs? Hi, Landon and Clara. <laughs> All right, very cool. Uh, that's a great question. We didn't talk about the albatross and the main reason is because I didn't see any. We didn't go to one of the islands where they were nesting. I don't think it was the right time of the year when we were there. So an albatross, for those who don't know, are these big, beautiful ocean traveling birds. So sometimes they'll get out onto the ocean. They hardly ever flap their wing. They use the currents you know, the air currents coming off of the water and they can stay flying for years at a time. And that's, that's absolutely incredible. Uh, and then they come to certain islands, these remote islands in the middle of the ocean, they come there to breed, uh, lay eggs and then have chicks and then take off and disappear again, sometimes for years. Some species will mate for life. So the same male and female, they, after they raise a chick, they disappear, they leave and then they come back that next year uh, and then they find each other and they do these big elaborate dances uh, when they when they found each other. They're so excited to see each other and it helps them kind of reaffirm their bond uh, as a pair. So uh, Galop or the albatross can be huge. I'm just gonna look this up to make sure I get the right uh, width here of their wingspan. Okay, here it is. So, uh, 
There is an albatross, the wandering albatross, and it has the largest wingspan of any living bird. So it can be about 12 feet. So picture that. I'm just about six feet tall. So my arms stretch almost six feet. You have to double that to have the wingspan uh, of this bird, uh, of this albatross. So absolutely huge. Um, they kind of drift uh, over the current. They find food to eat in the ocean, pick out things like squid uh, to eat. But then that also puts them in danger because as humans do a type of fishing called long line fishing, um, these are hooks on a big lines that can be miles long. The albatross sometimes dive down to take the bait and then get snagged on the hook, or they see the plastic floating in the water. So we have tons of plastic in our oceans up to a dump truck. Every minute is dumped into the ocean up to about 8 million tons a year of plastic. And that little plastic, those little colorful pieces of plastic can look a lot um, like uh, food. So they eat that plastic, they bring it back and feed it to their chicks. So chicks are often found with bellies full of, of plastic and do end up uh, dying from that. So um, yeah, the albatross are amazing birds. Um, you asked about the eggs. Some of the eggs can be four or five inches long. So, you know, like that, some of them even bigger. Um, so albatross eggs uh, can be pretty big compared to, you know, the chicken egg that you're used to uh, seeing in the store? That's a great question. Uh, let's see here. Let's go back to YouTube here. Why is the water so... Okay, I like this question. This is from... Oops, I just lost it. This is from Athena and Zoe, and they're wondering why the water is so cold if the Galapagos is right on the equator. All right. Well, in the deep ocean, you know, three, four, five kilometers deep, the water is very, very cold, just above freezing. And so that water kind of runs on a giant conveyor belt around the planet. And that giant global conveyor belt starts at places in the Arctic uh, and in the Antarctic, that cold water kind of melts and sinks and then moves through the planet on this big conveyor belt. And so that's responsible for a lot of our ocean currents. That's responsible for a lot of the weather patterns that we see. And so that big conveyor belt of cold water when it hits something like an island, so if you nice flat ocean, but then an island coming all the way up, when it hits something like that island, it, it's called upwelling. It pushes that cold water up to the surface. And so that cold water is also full of nutrients because everything that dies from tiny, tiny microscopic plankton to whales and sharks sinks down to the bottom, trapping tons of nutrients deep in the ocean. So when that cold current hits something like a seamount or an island, and it's pushed up to the top, it brings that cold nutrient rich water to the top, which is why the Galapagos is such an amazing place to, 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 to swim and to dive in around the ocean. It can support an amazing amount of life. Uh, another group joining us live today. We have Mrs. Woods joining us. She's representing her class from Toronto, Ontario. It looks like a grade five, six class. Mrs. Woods, I thought I'd pop your microphone on and see if any questions have come from your class tuning in. Thanks, Joe. Um, we have two questions. Sure. One of which is you're obviously very passionate about the Galapagos. How many times have you been there? And, yeah. you, and the second question was because the Galapagos Islands has such a unique set of um, circumstances, like a, a lack of predators, lack of humans, we want, we, it's renowned as having some species that aren't found elsewhere. What do you think is the best example of something that you would find in the Galapagos that can't be found elsewhere? Those are our questions. Okay, okay. very good questions. Uh, so sadly once, I've only ever visited once for 10 days. Um, you know, it's not an easy place to get to. Um, it can be expensive to get to. So it's a place, you know, growing up, reading about naturalists and, and and watching shows on TV. It's a place I knew I wanted to visit. It looked absolutely incredible. Um, so I hope I get a chance to go back again soon, but uh, only once uh, so far. So hopefully again soon. Uh, as for really unique species that can't be found anywhere else. I mean, there's a lot to choose from. It, you know, each little island has a, a unique species of tortoise um, that can't be found anywhere else in the world. I think the marine iguanas are another excellent example because there's no other 
uh, species of, of lizard iguana like that that can swim in salt water um, and feed that way. The flightless cormorants are another amazing example because anywhere else in the world, they can fly. They fly around from place to place. Um, they find their food uh, still in the water the same way, but in the Galapagos, they just took a different, a different evolutionary path uh, where those wings became vestigial. So um, I'm trying to think of one that I haven't talked about yet. That's another really good example that we saw there. Um, oh, okay, here's another one. There's these little lava lizards and they're really cool. So normally when you look in species, it's the male who uh, is flashier than the female. If you look at birds and reptile species, a lot of times the male has these big colorful feathers or has uh, these big dewlaps, these big flaps of skin or bright color, try to attract the female's attention and show that they could be a really good mate. But there's a type of lava lizard where it's the reverse. So the females have the really bright color. They've got this bright orange head uh, and then the male has really dull, drab, um, brown body. So the roles are kind of reversed, which is kind of cool. So it, the female has to get the male's attention and kind of show off and say, I'm really healthy. I'd be a really good choice. So in most species, when you look around the world, in a lot of cases, it's the male that, that is showier um, or builds something or does something to get the female's attention. So it's neat to see a species uh, where it's kind of flipped like that. And so that's a, that's a neat example. Uh, let's see what else is coming in via YouTube. So Tyler's wondering if there's other places in the world that have a lot of endemic populations. So islands, islands in the Pacific, islands uh, far from shore, that's where you get uh, these, little, these little areas. You know, areas where animals from the mainland get to uh, in a variety of different ways. Maybe they're brought there, maybe they drift there, maybe they fly there. Um, and then being isolated, cut off from their populations on the mainland, they can change in different ways compared to the mainland. The pressures that they experience uh, are completely different. So different traits are selected for uh, over time in these populations. So uh, islands around the world are great places to find uh, endemic species, species found nowhere else but a group of islands or one single island in that group. Because even a little span of ocean can be a huge obstacle for something like a small lizard uh, to cross? That's a great question. Um, let's try another one. Have I ever seen a fight with animals on, in the Galapagos? This is from a student from Queen Street Public School in Brampton, and absolutely. So those land iguanas I showed you are extremely territorial. So one day we were walking down a path and two males came and met each other and had a big fight. So there was one male that was a lot bigger um, and so he was bobbing his head up and down and slashing his tail around and the other male was trying to look tough and pump itself up and, and, and such. But once they started kind of bashing into each other a little bit, just kind of colliding uh, their heads together, the smaller one knew, okay, you know, my, my bluff is called, I'm not big enough, I got to get out of here. So uh, he took off. So that was a really cool example of a fight uh, that we saw. Let's see, let's visit our on-camera groups again for a moment. So let's go back to our first group from New Jersey. If you wanna pop your mic on, uh, we'll steal a question from you. How many islands are in the Galapagos? And which is your favorite and why? Okay, sort of an easy question to answer, sort of a tough question to answer. Uh, I am going to double check my numbers here on the islands because it all depends a little bit on what you consider an island because there, um, there's all kinds of little rocky uh, pieces that can stick up in different areas uh, of different sizes. But what I'm seeing when I double check online is there's 12 major uh, islands in the Galapagos, some say 13. Um, but the easy question to answer is my favorite. So Fernandina is that island I showed you. Let me share my screen one more time and I'll tell you a little bit about Fernandina. So just bear with me for one second while I find uh, that. Actually, I'll just look it up. That'll be easier because I closed my pictures. So Fernandina is the youngest island in the Galapagos. 
Let's find a good map here. Uh, yeah, let's use this one. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen one more time and I'm gonna show you Fernandina here. So Fernandina is the youngest island in the Galapagos. You can see the, them listed here. So here's Fernandina. And it is right near that hot spot on the ocean floor. So that hot spot where magma is making its way through a crack in the Earth's crust, uh, that's what built all of these islands on this big conveyor belt. So the older ones kind of move in this direction away from the hot spot. But these ones here, Isabella and Fernandina, are still volcanically active, and Fernandina is the youngest island. So why is it my favorite? Because uh, it's one of the more untouched ones. So it's hard to find water in the Galapagos. Anywhere there's fresh water, that's where sailors would go to get fresh water for their ship. And then they would also take animals. So they did this for hundreds of years. But Fernandina wasn't of that much interest to them because there wasn't um, an easily accessible fresh water supply. So they go to other islands instead. So Fernandina, uh, you know, it's almost like there's, there's a little more life on that, uh, on that island. So to give you an example, I'm standing on the shore looking out towards the ocean. So I'm standing somewhere here and I'm looking back at Isabella through this little channel. And in the water in front of me, there's 12, 13 sea turtles bobbing, just floating in the water, uh, getting some air. There's the flightless cormorant net ne nest next to me. There's two Galapagos hawks in the tree. The little rocky shore is covered in crabs and sea lions and marine iguanas. So everywhere you look, there is all this amazing life. Uh, you can almost reach out and touch all around you. So Fernandina was my favorite island uh, to visit by far. Great, great island. Uh, they were all amazing though. Uh, our other group in New Jersey, do you guys have another question? Oh, I lost your camera. I think you missed the mute button. We don't have any more questions. That's okay. Did you like seeing the pictures of the animals? Yes. All right. Yes. I hope you get a chance to visit the Galapagos one day uh, soon because it's pretty awesome. We have a trip planned. All right. Very cool. Um, Mrs. Woods, do you give me a wave if you have another question from your students? Yep. Okay. Let me pop your mic on. Gotcha. What, um, you spoke briefly about some of the invasive species. Yeah. What invasive species has been the biggest threat to the Galapagos Islands? Okay. Uh, I wanna say humans because, you know, we weren't there in the first place and we brought uh, a lot, if not uh, all of the invasive species, but there are a few that stand out. So uh, dogs and cats, um, you know, especially when they're not neutered or spayed, uh, cats can hunt those native birds that don't fly a lot, that uh, aren't used to having predators around. So that's a big issue. Uh, dogs can obviously catch things like the lizards and the, and the small tortoises and the, um, you know, other reptile species. Um, rats and mice. So rats and mice uh, eating a lot of the, uh, the eggs and the chicks and the, the younger, smaller animals and lizards play a huge issue. And then uh, goats. Goats are a huge problem in some areas still. So goats, obviously, when they get in an area, just strip the, the native plants. They just eat them, anything they can reach, as high as they can stand. Uh, and that's not good for things like tortoises and other animals that are low to the ground and need to eat that vegetation. But they've also done an amazing job of trying to eradicate goats on the island. So, you know, uh, they, they've hunted them from helicopters. Uh, they've even done things, they call them Judas goats, where they put a, a, a hormone, um, you know, a device that releases a hormone on a goat that attracts a large number of goats to one area. And then they're able to, to eradicate them that way. So Isabella, which is a massive island, the biggest one made of that kind of six volcano group, um, they've managed to uh, eradicate ghosts, uh, goats on, uh, on most of that area. So um, Lots of invasive species, unfortunately, but again, the, the work that they're doing and, you know, whole islands, they've been able, like Rabida, they've been able to get rid of the rats and goats and Isabella. And so 
they're working really hard to undo some of the damage uh, that we've caused. All right, so we can squeeze another question or two from YouTube here. So it's great to have so many uh, students join us from Colombia. So obviously Ecuador, very close neighbor uh, of Colombia. So it's great to see so many uh, joining us live. Um, from there, let's see. Um, so we've got one question from Connor. He's a student joining us. He's wondering how far apart the islands are. And it just depends. You know, some of them like Fernandina and Isabella, there's just a straight across. So maybe, um, you know, no more than a kilometer. Uh, you can see uh, the other island really close. And then there's some, there's two islands, Darwin and Wolf, that are way up in the north, almost like a different island group. They're so high up. Um, and so obviously there's, you know, hundreds of kilometers between those ones, but then that's an amazing dive spot. So that, you know, they're just these little rocks sticking out of the island uh, or out of the ocean. But then when you get below the water, you can be with schools of hundreds of hammerhead sharks uh, and whale sharks and all kinds of cool things uh, like that. Catherine is wondering about the biggest environmental problem that the islands suffer from. And I think invasive species is definitely uh, one of the biggest ones. And then another challenge is finding the right level of tourism. So, you know, whenever you visit a place, you have an impact, whether it's bringing lots of garbage in, whether it's where you walk. Um, so the Galapagos, they've been doing a great job of limiting how many people can visit, checking baggage and such to make sure there's no species, invasive species tagging along, and then limiting where people can visit. So you can cruise around the islands and sometimes you don't see another ship for days because they're all mapped out where they can be at certain times. So there's never the same ship in the same spot at the same time. Um, so they do just an amazing job. Where you can hike is very restricted, the size of groups you can be in. So they do do a lot of really good job. Um, Asia's wondering if an animal ever followed us on the island. So nothing really followed, but sometimes uh, there's a species of booby, there's the red-footed booby, and there's the Nazca booby as well. And sometimes they'll land right on you. Uh, sometimes the finches will land right on you. So nothing really followed us, but sometimes the birds would just land on you um, because you know you just look like something tall off the ground that can be landed on. They don't worry too much. And so one more question we'll take here. This one is about, um, let's see. So this one is about the temperature and the amount of rain. So. You know, for being on the equator, it, it didn't feel too hot. I mean, most days were up in the, in the high 80s degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is obviously warm, but I don't know, maybe I expected it to be a little bit warmer. The sun sets super fast on the equator. So by like six o'clock at night, all of a sudden the sun just goes and it's just gone. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the rain, the whole time we were there, we were there in one of the drier seasons. So in 10 days, we had rain for about... 15 minutes, like a misty rain uh, over a period of time. And then what's neat is most of the islands are pretty dry and pretty barren. But when you go to Santa Cruz, which is a really high elevation, uh, lots of cloud coverage, uh, a little bit more rain, it's almost like you're in a little bit of a, a temperate rainforest when you get higher up on that island and you find all the tortoises in the, in the forest eating and, and such. So it's almost like you stepped into a different world when you went higher up on the island, which was pretty cool. All right. Well, I think that's the time that we have for today. I want to give a huge shout out uh, to everybody who joined us uh, via YouTube today, uh, especially so many groups joining us from Columbia today. I want to give a shout out to our groups in New Jersey, as well as Ontario, who joined us live in the call today. Hope you learned a little bit about the Galapagos. I hope you'll dig in a little bit deeper. And then I hope we see you in some future events coming up. So thanks so much for spending some time with us today, and we are going to sign off for now. Thanks, everyone.